Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the Director of Software Engineering at ACI Learning. With me today is Cameron Guerra, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me today, Cam. Glad to be back. It's the uh, second week in a row. We're starting to get back on the swing of things with Haskell Weekly Podcast. So thank you guys for listening today. Uh, we're going to do something a little different today due to a comment we received from uh, a listener. Uh, and they wanted to kind of hear about what does software engineering look like at ACI Learning and what's our processes and how many services do we have and what do those services do so we're going to kind of take a deep dive into that today uh, our hope is to only have one episode of this but if we seem to be going over uh, just going to give you guys a heads up that we may have two but uh yeah so taylor why don't you get us started with a little high high level maybe process infrastructure that kind of thing so we can kind of drill down into the rest yeah as you mentioned this was prompted by a comment and I assume the person was more interested in kind of the Haskell side of things. So that's what we're gonna focus on. But to give context, um, we develop software using the Athid, uh, excuse me, Agile methodology. <laughs> um, Athid. Athid, yeah. Uh, well, everyone has a different definition of Agile, so ours can be Athid. Uh, but we use Agile, which just means that we're constantly uh, getting feedback and making improvements and iterating on that. And the tool that we use to manage our workflow from a high level is Clubhouse, not the video chat application, but the one that is soon going to be called Shortcut instead. And we use that more or less as a Kanban board to keep track of all the stories or tasks that we want to accomplish and track them as they move through our workflow, starting from ready for development all the way through in production in our users' hands. Um, from the code side of things, like many software shops, we manage our code in GitHub. And most of the code goes through kind of the normal GitHub PR process where somebody pushes up a branch, they open up a PR for it. Uh, at least one person on the team reviews that PR and then we hit the big green button on GitHub and it gets merged into master. At that point, uh, it kicks off a continuous integration build. We use Semaphore to manage our continuous integration. So if, or sorry, the, the build actually happens before that, but also, once it's merged into the main branch, uh, Semaphore will build it and produce a build artifact, which in our case is a bunch of different Docker container images. And it will push those over to AWS. And then we use AWS Fargate for most of our services. And those will launch all the new uh, versions of all those Docker images and get it out into our users' hands. Uh, we use a bunch of AWS services. not really worth enumerating all of them right now. but. As I mentioned, we use Fargate, uh, and we have several Haskell services running in production. Our current best guess count is that we have seven of them, um, and we may say their names later on. So just for context, their names are Urza, Ion, Nucleus, GIF, Shalab, Quantum, and Buffer Processor. So some of them are descriptive, some of them are a little more imaginative, and some of them are just people's names. So um, yeah, those Jeff. are the... <laughs> those are the uh, processes we use, the infrastructure we deploy to, and the names and number of our Haskell services. But I'm sure the listeners are much more interested in how we write that Haskell. So Cam, do you want to kind of dive into that? Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> with these multiple services, they all have multiple functions. Um, and, you know, through time, we've we have kind of a set of APIs that are all in Haskell, and then we have some other of these services that manage, uh, you know, scheduling and managing like a job queue, uh, you know, updating some third-party services on a continu continuous basis, uh, allowing us to integrate uh, the organization's teams uh, with something that can happen on the back end. So uh, that's kind of what Shalab is, and then um, something to kind of aggregate and handle metrics, which is kind of the buffer processor. So those services are, are kind of like kind of what they do. Um, and there's an ion and nucleus being the APIs. Nucleus was the first one. So this is when we're all learning Haskell. We were all kind of figuring it out. Like Taylor had been a pro, you know, kind of had come in to help guide us. Um, we previously started with Elm. So we've been, you know, with nucleus, we kind of took some of the the easier to digest uh, choices, like maybe using uh, technologies like Hapstack and 
Orville for an ORM for Postgres, um, and like Hapsack being our web server, uh, kind of a little more loosey goosey um, and the abilities and what it can do. And so that was where we kind of started. And we said, okay, like let's figure out what we can do better. And, and that's where Nuke Ion came in. And then from the, oh, we have one question coming from the audience. Yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in and say that uh, Orville isn't one of the more well-known Haskell ORM uh, libraries. And that was developed by Flipstone, which is a contracting firm that was working with IT Pro TV back in the day when I started several years ago. And, uh, you know, great library, very happy to use it, but similar to Hapstack in that um, most of the checks happen at runtime rather than at compile time. So just if y'all want to look it up, uh, github.com slash flipstone slash Orville. Yep. And uh, if you guys want, we can also post the links um, to all this kind of stuff we're talking about. It, we're not going to post them all because that would be a lot uh, because we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the lay of the land with the services. You know, with, you know, Ion, we made better choices. And then with Urza, we, we made even better choices. So um, I think we'll kind of jump into that now of kind of what's what are we libraries that we're using now and um, kind of where have we come from? Sure. And we'll start with where we started. Makes sense. Uh, as I mentioned, for the kind of database abstraction layer, we started with Orville, which is a wrapper around uh, PostgreSQL simple, if I remember correctly. And that worked great. Uh, has a lot of things that I really like. But one of the downsides was that, as I mentioned, most of the validation happens at runtime. So for instance, if you mistype a column name or you get the column name correct, but say that it's the wrong type. So you pulled a string, but you thought it was an int. Um, those checks are only gonna blow up for you at runtime rather than compile time, which uh, you know hopefully you would cast, catch in testing or catch at some point, but it would be nice if you could catch them at compile time. So that motivated us to look for a different library and there are many database abstraction libraries available in Haskell. Um, the one that we decided to go with was Persistent and also Esqueleto is kind of like a add-on library for doing more complicated SQL queries. So we sometimes use that one when we need to do a join or something like that. But what Persistent got us was the ability to have um, strongly typed queries. So we would know that the field we're querying for, we got that name correct, and we would know that the type that we're comparing that against is also correct. Or when we pull it out of the database, that part is also correct. So those are huge wins for us. Um, and it means that stuff that you used to have to catch either with a test or in code review can now be caught by the compiler, which is great. Um, and that's, you know, just one part, one little library. And, and there are many other libraries that can do that, but yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the move from, you know, Orville with runtime issues to Persistent was a little bit of jump due to, you know, it's more type level programming um, and a little bit more uh, abstraction that wasn't as, like, the Orville library is pretty verbose in, like, creating tables and, you know, all these, like, what these fields look like and this kind of, kind of stuff. Whereas, like, Servant kind of, like, says, okay, what do you want? I'll generate it and persistent. make it for you. Sorry, Persistent. But that leads me to my next point of kind of <laughs> the web, you know, web servers we were using. You know, I mentioned earlier Hapstack, and you know, Ion and Nucleus were built on Hapstack, and that was great. It started us off. We got moving with it. It uh, you know allowed us to move a majority of our legacy JavaScript API into Haskell. So it was a great step. But we started to see shortcomings with that. Um, we started to kind of get our wires crossed with what routes were and where they were, like how do they, what the types were. And like you had to go, if you wanted to know what something was gonna return to you, you had to kind of search for it by finding that file. And then also you don't have documentation out of the box. So it just kind of created a lot of little tensions and paper cuts for us that eventually helped us choose to go with Servant. Um, so Servant is a type leveled web server, um, or it's a type, yeah type programming, more or less, where you say, okay, my API is going to have this type, and this is what's going to be returned. It's kind of easy to read, easy to comprehend, and the handler function is, you know, digestible, kind of uh, easy to 
to grok rather than having to jump through all these hoops to kind of figure out what's happening um and that was you know a big step for us because we weren't really sure what s servant would look like um but we we took that step with a smaller like side project and we saw okay like this isn't too bad we kind of got the team on board and you know we, we ended up getting some really great benefits out of servant one of them being the swagger um documentation that it can generate and that has really helped with the product that us as an engineering team delivers to you know the the front end team who needs to understand and know what our api is doing so uh, you know I, i'm a big fan of servant it was definitely a shift but i'm really glad we ended up where we are uh, and i'm looking forward to uh, getting everything into servant and not having hapstack any longer yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. And it's worth pointing out that both Persistent and Servant are uh, new libraries that we are moving to. So we haven't migrated everything over yet, but we're getting there. And we have bought in on both of these libraries. So we tried out some of the alternatives and we've done like little spikes for these to make sure that they'll work for our case. And now we're doing the you know tedious work of actually moving every model, every endpoint over into these new things. And it's going well, but we're just not done yet. Um, and I wanted to mention one of the upsides of Hapstack was something that we don't really or didn't really take advantage of, which is that it's really cleverly designed and everything happens inside this kind of server monad. So if you want to do routing, that's in the server monad. If you want to get something out of the query string or a header or the body, that's all in the monad. If you want to return something or uh, throw an exception to, you know, say something is not found, it's all in the same monad. And it's actually really clever how that's architected and it lets you do some neat tricks to implement things. But for us, like you mentioned, it got really challenging to figure out what route, what does the route look like for this handler? Or what does the, what is the body supposed to look like? Um, which feel like they should be simple questions to answer. And they're kind of hard with Hapstack because of that architecture. Right. And there's, especially, you know, we just kind of hit that point of, you know, too many routes to kind of like quickly parse and digest what we needed to do and where we needed to go. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you know, so we've talked about those two libraries quite a bit as far as like what's new, uh, you know, and, I, and I'd like to talk a little bit more. Um, we use HSpec for testing. So, you know, I know there's a lot of different testing op options out there. For us, HSpec has worked the best. Uh, we've kind of just started with it and, and gone with it. Um, another thing we have created for IT Pro TV ACI is the Prolude. Um, so that's our own custom prelude and we're uh, big fans of that kind of all those rote things we use all the time from these little smaller base libraries is you know nice and easy to use or base packages I'm sorry um, you know that makes it a little easier to use yeah and I wanted to go back to HSpec really quick uh, one of the reasons that we use HSpec is that uh, not only is the manner of writing the test cases really convenient where you know it should do this thing and then blah 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 should be that like it's a nice uh, dsl for writing tests but the hspec discover kind of um, extra program that it runs to discover all the tests is really nice because it lets us avoid writing all that boilerplate of like yeah we wrote the test file uh, but you actually have to rig it up into the test suite and you can forget to do that. Or if you do remember, it's still just tedious. So having that done automatically is super nice. Um, and Cam, as you mentioned with the Prolude, which is our custom Prelude, we resisted this for a while. And part of the motivation was onboarding new people is probably going to be easier if you don't have a custom Prelude because everything is the same as quote unquote normal Haskell. But we discovered that we were very, very often doing the same things over and over again. So we'd always import the same libraries the same way and use lots of the same functions from them. And we thought, okay, well, let's take a uh, data-driven approach to this and analyze our code base to figure out what things do we use the most and let's push them into a custom prelude so that we don't have to import those things all the time. And this worked great for us. It was just awesome way to develop a custom prelude. Um, and clearly there are some things that are convenient to have that you don't use all the time. So this doesn't get everything, but it gets a lot of things. So shout out to Sarah, one of the engineers on our team for doing that whole process and developing this prolude. It's been a huge benefit to our team. Agree, agree, agree. Um, yeah. So, uh, you had mentioned something earlier, Taylor, that we use 
AWS for infrastructure um, and AWS, the library for Haskell really has done the best and is the most well uh, explored would be Amazonka, which, you know, they have, they made choices that, you know, have made it maybe a little harder sometimes for new, you know, Haskell developers to figure it out. But once you kind of start to understand and, and see the conduits and see how kind of all of the, the information plays out, you know, Amazon kind of turns out to be in like all the lenses, like turns out to be pretty nice because um, it is so um, vast in the amount of services yeah. it supports and covers. But ooh, it's yeah, it's a great cool. library. Uh, and it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's built from Amazon's own description of their API and their services and everything. So it's very, uh, it's got everything, it's comprehensive. Um, and as you mentioned, it does have some complexity. So it uses conduits and it uses lenses, both of which are more advanced concepts. But you notice we were talking about servant and persistent earlier, which also use advanced concepts with type level programming and template Haskell quasi quotes. Um, and that's been kind of the story of the development process or the engineering process for us, where uh, we started with really simple stuff, the types of things that we felt comfortable we could implement ourselves, you know, if we needed to. Obviously, we didn't write our own libraries for everything, but uh, we've been reaching out to more advanced libraries and techniques to push things into compile time errors at the expense of maybe they're a little harder to understand. We feel less confident about, you know, could we implement this type of thing ourselves? Like, you know, I think given enough time, we could probably write our own servant library. And there are great resources for doing exactly that, but it's not something everyone on the team could comfortably do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's something, you know, like you said, we, we try to keep it simple in the beginning because I mean, myself included, we were learning Haskell, like we didn't have that really you know, understanding of the functional paradigm and the things going on. So that's what we were wrestling with mostly. Now the more advanced things in Haskell, they were way beyond our reach at that point. And so I think as a team, we've done a good job communicating with each other saying, okay, hey, here's something, here's a limitation of this library, but here's another one that could, you know, it's a little harder. There's a little more uh, underneath the covers, but it's gonna give you you know, a little bit more safety and benefits, uh, long-term. Um, so it's like a short-term complexity learned, but a long-term benefit. And I think that's kind of the, the line we tow as an engineering team, because we do know we're going to grow and we're going to have new engineers come on board. And, you know, there's not a lot of Haskell developers out there looking for jobs. And so when we are looking for one, we want to make sure it's appealing. It's something that's, you know, not one way or the other like we, we like to try to you know be a middle ground for uh, just how we write haskell and how we communicate and all those things so uh, yeah that's <clears throat> kind of you know the reasons we've made some of these choices and how we kind of balance that yeah and i think a great example of that is not even switching libraries but staying with the whole library at the same time so like every you know web programmer we deal with JSON and we use the ASON library to encode and decode JSON, which is kind of the bog standard, everybody uses it library. But the manner in which we use it has changed over the past two to four years. Um, back in the day when we were writing more, what you might call simple Haskell, we wrote all of the instances by hand. So we would define a data type and then we would define the from JSON instance and the to JSON instance. More recently, we have moved away from doing that. And instead we use generic deriving to do those for us. So we don't have to write that code anymore. It gets written automatically. And we can be sure that the implementation of those functions matches the shape of the data type, which is something that anyone who's written these instances knows it's pretty easy to accidentally, you know, misname one of the keys or get something flipped around. Um, but another one of the motivations for us actually ties in with the different change we made switching to servant. One of the benefits of servant is that we get API documentation for free. And part of that is that the types in your API need to have schema instances and we could write those by hand, but then we have to keep not only the data type and the JSON instance in sync, but both of those have to be in sync with the schema instance. So that's a lot of code that all has to change together. 
and you either have to catch it in code review or write tests for it or something. But um, the easy way out and the way that we took is to use generic deriving. And that way your schema instance matches your JSON instance because they both use the same mechanism for generating that code. And that's been really nice, huge uh, decrease in the amount of code that we write and huge increase in the consistency of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been nice. Um, we definitely have had some tensions here and there with it relating to build times and things. Um, and Taylor knows he's been working on some stuff to kind of see what we can do about that. But, you know, for the most part, the benefits are, are there. And, you know, yes, it may be a little bit more hand wavy, but you have that comfort of it's all, it's all the same. It's all doing the same stuff behind the scenes. And, you know, when you're dealing with really any any code base you want to make sure that at least there's consistency that's another thing within our team that like we're trying to continue to work towards is consistency and naming in you know imports um you know our style guide <laughs> you know so like there's some things that uh, you know you want to make sure are consistent and you know generic deriving gives you that and i'm really grateful for it because it's saved me a ton of boilerplate time too um because we were starting to hit more hiccups with like our JSON instances and all those things of, oh, we encode it one way, but decode it another. And then that's problematic and you're really creating more work for yourself. So, um, you know, yeah. Anyways, uh, did yeah. we want to, I know we're kind of in the middle here of, um, you know, all of our services. We've really been talking about APIs at this point. Uh, and we have four other services that kind of do all four different things. And so <clears throat> the another library that we, we lean into is which which we talked about last week. So if you missed last week's podcast, go check it out. Uh, that was actually written by Taylor. It really allows us to switch between uh, types a lot easier and a lot more effectively um, and a little more easy on the eyes as well. Um, so yeah, Taylor. Yeah, uh, and that touches on what you mentioned earlier of consistency. So which, as we talked about last episode, gives a consistent interface to switch between or convert between types. Um, and we've been talking a lot about libraries, but that consistency goes to other things as well. So for instance, the formatting of our code base. Um, this is contentious, not just in Haskell, but in every programming language of how should things be formatted? Should it be up to the individual developer? Should you try to match the style of the file that you're editing? Uh, should there be kind of a house style that everyone follows or should a tool enforce the style? And we've chosen to have a tool enforce the style. So we use Brittany to format all of our source code. And uh, this took some uh, you know, discussion among the team to land on a configuration that we were comfortable with. And then we had to have this big bang PR where everything gets formatted with Brittany and we switch everything over. But I think the end result has been really nice. And we actually test it in our CI environment as well. So we know that when code gets merged into the main branch, it all, it's all formatted the same way. And it may not be anyone's preferred format, but everyone is comfortable with it and you don't have to think about formatting anymore. You just run it through Brittany and you're done. So that's been really nice. And it, you know, for me, it makes it a lot easier to review code because everything has the same visual style and I know what expressions should look like, what types should look like. So it's a lot easier to skim over. Right, doesn't disorient you. Um, yeah, I know another tool <clears throat> that we use um, for our code base and kind of kind of creating some sort of rules around function choices or line width or well, I guess Brittany really handles line width, but uh, you know restricting functions, restricting certain uh, language extensions, those kind of things. We use HLint to um, or HLint if you're uh, <laughs> read it read it straightforward, but uh, that allows us to have, you know, our own configuration to say, yes, this, we're okay with this, but we're not okay with this. And if you see something like this, change it out for this, um, which is, I know a lot of this is, but it does give you that like consistency across the code base that you're not like one file using this function, which is really the same as what's being done in another function, but it's written differently. And so like kind of creating that consistencies with HLint has really helped um, our development process as well. Yeah, and this also helps with onboarding because there are some things that you can rule out. Uh, for instance, 
since we have our own custom prelude, we can exclude functions from the prelude that we don't like, you know, like head, which is partial. And instead we want to either pattern match on it or use something like um, safe head or one of those various functions. Um, and maybe. if we didn't do that, or for functions that uh, are in our prelude but are, you know, questionable maybe, we can have an hlint rule that just says, uh, this isn't preferred. Here's another way to do it. Uh, but if you know what you're doing, you can disable the hlint rule there and be on your merry way. So it's a good way of teaching more junior de developers or people who are onboarding about uh, the style that we like to write in. And by and large, we use the same community hlint rules as everyone else. So it's the community style. Yeah, you know, I know we uh, we have a rule in there for the uh, utterable IO. <laughs> Uh, a cursed unsafe. unutterable io that one, unsafe yeah. perform io yeah those we, we can't use those but uh you know maybe next week i'll ask taylor to, to let us happen <laughs> and uh yeah so like i mean we're just kind of starting on the tools and you know i'm gonna kind of kind of get quick in this next little bit because we're gonna kind of talk about um, our day-to-day -day development tools our editors and kind of what our locals and local environments look like. Um, so we use Stack for majority of our services. One of them uses Cabal uh, to build and manage uh, packages and all that stuff. And then, uh, so that's kind of pretty, you know, I know there's people who are one side versus the other, but we chose to use Stack and it's worked well for us, but we're not opposed to Cabal. So we have a Cabal package. Uh, and then we have GHID um, for development, as well as HLS or Purple Yolk. So those three kind of uh, amongst the team are, are used in different ways. So I'm usually a GHID kind of guy where I run it, get it going. Um, I have used Purple Yolk before, but HLS has been always giving me issues. So I kind of uh, kind of shy away from that. Yeah, and Purple Yolk, not super well known. It's something that I wrote. It's just a VS Code extension that basically works the same as GHCID, where it fires up GHCI in the background, and when you save a file, reloads GHCI, and then shows you the warnings and errors in your editor. And I wrote it because HLS is a fantastic piece of software, and it's amazing, and it's way more powerful than Purple Yolk, but it's also, um, the, I don't know, rickety maybe is the best word I can use to describe it, where when it works, it is amazing, but it doesn't always work. And that was frustrating to me. I prefer, uh, more stupid tools that are more reliable. So that's why I built Purple Yolk. But we also use GHCID because it's kind of the quintessential stupid tool that just works. So um, yeah, we, we have a lot of options there for our quick feedback loop in development. Yeah, I like I like GHCID because it's KISS. Keep it stupid. Yeah. Keep it simple stupid, not stupid simple. <laughs> that either, I guess either one works. But uh, yeah, and like you said, VS Code is, you know, generally the term, you know, the editor that everybody uses um we do have an emacs guy we love him to death he's awesome he also is a nix guy as well so you know he he's he's trying to work us in which is totally totally admirable so um he's mm -hmm. our emacs nix user and then for local development we use docker uh and docker compose to lift up our services and and create local networks that they can communicate with each other and all that stuff. Um, that way it's any machine can run it. We're not machine dependent. It's all kind of built into the Docker images and those will all be run. So that is kind of the rundown on our tooling. Uh, sorry to kind of whiz by it, but if you guys have any more comments or questions or you want us to dive deeper, obviously, you know, you know where to find us. Just comment. And we will... Uh, take it into account and look at uh, maybe expounding upon it. Yeah, and I just wanted a, a quick mention about Docker. Um, we use it both for local development and for our production deployments, which has been really nice because at any point you can grab the Docker image that's actually running in production and run it locally and see, you know, how exactly does it behave. Um, but also for local development, it's been really nice to reduce, not entirely eliminate, but almost entirely eliminate like the works on my machine syndrome where one developer has something that works great and then they push it up and the other developer pulls it down and doesn't work. 
Um, we have very, very few of those problems, and it's mostly due to Docker. Um, not to say that it's the only solution to that problem, but that it has more or less solved that problem for us. Yep, for sure. Um, cool. So we talked about tooling. I did want to kind of jump in real quick to kind of code layout. How do we structure our code? And what are what are some of the choices we made along the way to to be where we are today? Uh, so Taylor, you want to start us off on that? Sure. Uh, the way that we like to lay out code today is to more or less have one module per type. And it's a little tedious because there's a certain amount of overhead involved with making a new module. But the benefit is that when you want to use that type, you can import that module and you can import it qualified, which we normally do. And then you can use really short identifiers in that module. So you don't have to make names that are globally unique or even unique among a bunch of stuff. It just has to be unique within that module, which is usually pretty easy to do. Um, and we actually arrived at this because in our list of services up at the top, we had Nucleus. Uh, we used to have another service called Metrics, and then they got pushed together into one service called Ion. Um, and we had kind of this catch-all module that was the glue between those two modules, all the stuff that was common. And that meant that it had a lot of stuff in it and we had to make the names unique within that module. And that was painful. Um, and that's part of the reason, uh, I guess we didn't say this, but our main code base is called Smurf. And the reason we called it that is that we ended up with a lot of repeated names where you'd have something like person dot person name of person. And you're like, okay, th this is getting ridiculous now. We need to do something about it. Um, so that's why we're trying to move toward the one module per type, or we are moving toward that. Um, but yeah, that, that's for our types and stuff. But Cam, do you want to talk about how our API is set up? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, like Taylor said, we have one module per type, and we have separated like our types, our queries, and our API uh, handlers into separate files and in a different structure. That way, uh, you know, we're not trying to import something from an API that's in another API or anything along those lines. And we also pull out, uh, you know, more common actions into separate files as well. So, you know, say you want to create a course, well, you know, or a person, you know, we, we create the person action and then we'd have a run for it and that would give us a new person. And so um, some people would say that's uh, not the way making people works, but, you know, we're not going to get into that today. Um, <laughs> It just uh, came to my head, so I you know, wanted to do that. <laughs> But then we also have uh, each handler is in their own file. So with our servant handlers, you know, the route and the handler are in there, so it's a little easier to comprehend what's going on. And then in our nucleus and ion uh, handlers, it's just kind of the handler formula supporting functionality. And, you know, I have a, a dog who likes to bark in the middle of a podcast. So <laughs> uh, we'll see if we can edit that out. If not, that was my dog, Ruth. Hi, Ruth. Um, but yeah, one thing I wanted to, to go over there again was that you mentioned actions in separate files for stuff like creating users. Uh, this is a pattern known as uh, like a command object in a different language. And in fact, at a previous job, I worked in Ruby and I worked with a coworker of mine, Aaron, to develop a library called Active Interaction. And so that's kind of, I pushed for this in our code base here because I was really familiar with the concept and it's surprisingly powerful of let's, take this thing that we want to do that's complicated and pull it out into its own file and have well-defined inputs and outputs, which granted you get for free in Haskell, that's the type system, but uh, pull it out over there so that if you want to call it from the API or if you want to call it from a script or you want to call it from a job, they can all just use that thing and you don't have to worry like, oh crap, well, when you make a user in the API, it does it this way, but when you call the script, it does it this other way and then those things invariably get out of sync with each other. Oh yeah, yeah, we had that issue, especially when we were starting to move uh, kind of legacy endpoints from Ion and Nucleus into Urza. We would kind of have this two definitions of these things in the meantime and then change one and then the other would have an issue. So uh, kind of moving towards that actions file kind of isolated, you know, and, and uh, more or less kind of siloed what, that, what was happening rather than kind of trying to do anything, not the wild, wild west. Um, and you did kind of touch on scripts, um, you know, business needs various needs and reports and metrics re returned or, you know, things merged or this or that. So we kind of have a, uh, a whole, 
directory of scripts that are just kind of run off one off scripts that we can run whenever the person needs it or whatever or we'll create a new one if we don't have it uh, and those are kind of also live in smurf that's just like a thing we can run on our local machines connect to the database and we're good to go yeah and a quick note there about kind of the life cycle often we'll get a request for a new report type and we'll write a script for it because that's the easiest thing for us and then if we get another request for a report of that same type we'll start to think, okay, maybe we need to put this into a job, something that can run you know, every week, every month, something like that. Or we need to expose it to our internal you know, staff users so that they can just click a button and get that report rather than having them to ask us for it. So often things that start off in scripts will kind of graduate into becoming an action that then is exposed through a job or a web UI. Yep, yep. And you know, that's kind of uh, what quantum does is handles is our it's our job uh, manager and using odd jobs like we said earlier and so you know that's definitely you know even this week we had a script that was uh i was running for about 30 minutes it was like that was the runtime for it and so we kind of evaluated it. i said oh yeah like when things start to go like that we say okay what can we do differently and we take a look at the code and we kind of you know dissect it and see what's going on well we saw we had a re repetitive kind of we were making database calls within a loop. And so rather than just trying to get all the information at once, we were trying to do it eat for each company we had, which we got a lot of companies. So that was, you know, pegging our CPU usage on our database and um, taking forever to run. So um, we pulled that out, like fixed that up, and then got that down to about 42 seconds and turned that into a job because it is a monthly report that is asked for a lot. In 30 minutes a month, 30 minutes a month can be expensive especially because if you're trying to do something else and you forget to ever send it to the people who need it there's a lot of things there that you know can kind of create these hiccups so that is kind of what even bred the idea of quantum in our job queue is like this kind of repetitive rote thing that was always happening that doesn't really need engineering work and we can kind of push it off and automate parts parts of our job which have been a huge, huge help. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Cam, as you mentioned earlier, we're always happy to get uh, questions or comments from our listeners. So if you, you know, we, it sounds like we've been talking for a long time about a lot of different things, but really we've just been scratching the surface here. If there's any part of this you want to hear more about, if there's something that we didn't mention that you're curious about, please let us know. We're on Twitter. It's probably the easiest way to get a hold of us. Just go to twitter.com slash Haskell Weekly. Um, but I'm pretty sure those were all the things that I had to cover, at least for today. Cam, was there anything else you wanted to go over? I mean, like you said, we're just scratching the surface. So I think this is a good start and uh, we'd love to hear your feedback and uh, we can definitely expound upon things as uh, you'd like. So uh, just really appreciate you guys joining us. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I have been your host, Taylor Fossack, and with me today was Cameron Guerra. If you want to find out more about us, like I said, we're on Twitter, or you can go to our website, which is haskellweekly.news. And we're brought to you by our employer, IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company. They would like to offer you 30% off a lifetime of your subscription by using promo code haskellweekly30 at checkout. And all you got to do is go to igpro.tv and you'll see how you can sign up there. Uh, and that Haskell Weekly 30 promo code will get you 30% off. So uh, I think that about does it for us. Thanks again for joining us on the Haskell Weekly Podcast and we'll see you next week.